Good morning, Devox. Hello, Devox. First Monday, first uh, deep dive session. So yeah, I guess we can say welcome to Devox. Yeah. yeah. Welcome to Devox. Are you all happy to be here? Yes? <laughs> year after year, that's really good. Who, who is here for the first time? Oh, Ooh. that's great. I so envy you. The first experience is always the, the best one. Yeah. Yeah, we're kind of old timers here. So yes, Java keeps throttling up with, with a nice reference to an old video game. Maybe some of you remember this video game. Released the same year as Java was released, 1995, by the way, and uh, remastered recently. Um, my name is Jose. I am Remy. And uh, that's the one with YouTube where you have to say something. <laughs> So I am a Java champion. Um, I do some stuff on the Open GDK, and we will see. Okay. So obviously, my name is Jose. If he's Remy, I'm, I mean, be Jose. I just put some links here where, to content that I publish on the on the web, including my GitHub account and uh, some kind of a YouTube channel on which I like to bookmark talks I find interesting and relevant if you if you want to have information uh, in the Java space. Right, I'm also a Java champion and a Java rockstar. Great. We don't work for Oracle, neither, yeah. neither yourself, neither, no. neither me, uh, but still we're going to talk about things that are going to happen in the future. And it's quite hard to tell about things that haven't happened yet. Uh, so things that are going to happen in the future is hard to talk about them in the past. So just don't believe what we're going to say. Things might change. The, please, please, please don't uh, um, uh, use uh, what you see for your product. <laughs> <laughs> or do it at, at your own risk? Is, is, is it no, what no, people don't, say? <laughs> don't do that at all. <laughs> Knowing that the risk is really huge, so don't do it. That's it. Great. Um, so, if we take a look at the past, there's something really important that happened starting with Java 9, and you, I guess you're all aware of that now. We have one major release of, of the JDK every six months, which is great. It means that many projects are underway and are going to deliver parts of themselves in each version either with this system of, of pre-release, and we had that for the switch expression, for instance, we're going to talk oh, about that. Preview release. Yeah, preview, pre preview release. And once the preview release uh, has been found to be okay, to be compatible, to be nice, etc., well, it makes it to the stage and it's pushed to the, to the main release of the JDK and it becomes a feature uh, of the JDK. There, there are at least one JEP, I think two JEPs, that are describing this process very precisely. So when, when something is published as a preview release, you, you need to add some flags to the compiler and to the JVM to be able to compile code to test those preview releases and to, yeah. and to run them. So it's preview feature, technically. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so if we take a look at what happened in, a, in the past two years, in fact, yes, four yeah. major versions, that's two years, not much. Uh, we had many things that things that can be seen as developers and things really behind the behind the curtain uh, in the JVM. We have the var keyword, and we're going to talk about that a little. Um, Condi, which is a short nickname for um, constant dynamic. Con constant dynamic. It's not. It, it, it's a new uh, bytecode element that added to the JVM. Added to by Technically, it's of. not a new bytecode. It's a new constant pool constant. Yeah. Uh, that is going to be used in the future. It's not really mm, used currently, yeah. but it should help uh, improve the the loading time of applications. Yeah. Kind yeah. of. Uh, we have the nest mates, which is a How could you say that? Bug fixing or a yeah. hack fixing? No, 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 it's a real bug fixing. Okay. Uh, that allowed you to access private classes bypassing the, 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 the security checking of the JVM. So this has been fixed. And the next big thing is the expression switch. Two preview released, one that has been uh, given up. Uh, and another one that is currently in the JDK 13 and that should make it to JDK 14. Yeah. And we're going to, to show that to you. It will not be a preview anymore. 
yeah, so it will be a new feature of the language. And if we take a look at the future, 14 plus, we have a bunch of things that, that are going to be, re that should be released in the future. That uh, will be released. That will be released, yes, of course. But we don't, it's, it's 14 plus, right? Maybe 15, 16, we don't know. What's nice is that once a feature is ready, you don't have to wait for more than, than, than six months to have it uh, in, in, a, in a JDK, which is nice. There's something um, with the instance of, uh, sealed interface and type switch, and all this is part of, of the Ember project that will lead, in the end, to the pattern matching, to the introduction of the pattern matching concept which comes from functional programming in, uh, in Java. And on the other hand, there are the inline types. Inline types are part of the project Valhalla, and we're going to talk about that too. So yeah, that's basically the, the agenda of this talk, talking about what's, what, what lies ahead in the future for, for the future of Java, and hopefully for the best, of course. All right. Good artists copy, and great artists steal. Does it make Java a great artist? <laughs> I don't know, but uh, <laughs> uh, if you take a look to, to Java, Java um, usually doesn't um, create new feature from thin hair. It just uh, take a feature that already exists in another language and make it Java-like, or something like this. Yeah. So that, that's a picture of Picasso, and we're going to have more pictures by this guy, who was a great artist and who stole a lot. Um, but he, he said that, basically, so yes. I mean, it's okay to, to say that. All right, so what was the plan? We're going to talk about Loom, this um, yeah. new concurrency model for the, for, the, for, for the Java platform, about Amber, which uh, final goal is to introduce pattern matching uh, in Java, and there are several... Uh, steps towards pattern matching. Uh, Valhalla, which is the inline type, about inline type. This will be for in the second part of this talk. And uh, we'll talk a little about Panama and Valhalla, but not, yeah. not the whole Panama. No. And um, I think Thursday, Maurizio uh, have a full talk yeah. about Panama uh, at DevOx. Yeah. Maybe you can say who is Maurizio? Oh, um, it's a compiler guy, uh, a smart guy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. First, a little little question to the audience, just to make sure that you're all awake early this Monday morning. What is the best new feature introduced in the Java 14? And this is something that we haven't talked about yet. Yeah. I think we have a demo of that. Well, you have a demo. I have a demo of that. You have a demo. So maybe we can s try to switch <laughs> this machine and show that. <laughs> Um, so, let's say we have a class uh, person with a name, and we have a main, and I stupidly initialize person with null. Oh, no, you can't do that in Java, can you? <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, Java, Java has no pointer, so what's this null pointer exception? Shouldn't it Sadly, exist? if I, I run this example, I will have a null pointer exception. And... Um, if I take a look, I will say at line 20, I have a null pointer exception, and I have no idea if it's the first dot which is responsible of the null pointer exception, or if it's the second dot. And You mean we don't know if person.name is null, or, yeah. or person is null, right? Yeah. And now we have a new... Uh, magic incantation that you can <laughs> put here and yeah wow wow do you mean that we have a new error message yeah that's telling us which which element of the expression is null exactly but that that's that's awesome <laughs> So yeah, how much time have we have we been waiting for that? Twenty years? <laughs> Twenty-five. I think. Most of the people here were not even born at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, if by example it's a name which is null, you will have something that say you cannot invoke to a, to uppercase because person dot name is null. 
And if I if I try to uh, to box or unbox, so another demo, <laughs> a very common uh, issue. This one is nasty. And if I just run it, I will have a message that say. So basically, here I get an integer and sees as an int. So I got a null pointer, and this is exactly what the error message say. So you mean that in that case, if you if you take a look at the code again, you ha you have map dot get that is returning a null null object, and it's the <laughs> auto unboxing that is throwing the null pointer exception. Yeah. So you don't even have a dot operator in that in that expression. Yeah. That generates that. All right. well, uh, this is for me the best uh, um, feature because uh, as a teacher now I have to do just nothing. <laughs> and 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 the whole um, if if you take a look, um, the, the the whole message can be googled. So I have really nothing <laughs> to do anymore. <laughs> this was already the case before. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. Well, that's yeah. I think. Do Do you like this feature? We will. We yeah. Yes. Kind of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We we'll like it. Great. Um. One thing which we, which is great is that this feature was not implemented by someone from Oracle. It's someone from SAP. Basically, they have uh, this feature in their V um, since, don't remember, but several years. Uh, how it works, you don't have to recompile your code. Uh, you only need to have the, the debug information in it. Uh, usually, you have already the debug information in it. You mean to have the name of the variable, if, if it's a local yes. variable? Uh, technically, if you don't have the name of the local variable, um, you will have something that says it's parameter one or something like this, if, if the name are not present. So no need to recompile. Um, basically, it's a static analysis of the bytecode that uh, extract uh, the information. Uh, currently, it's under a flag. You have to uh, write uh, dash xx plus show code details in exception message. And in 15, it should be the default. Um, it should be enabled by default. Uh, why it's not enabled currently by default? It's because uh, now the VM do some work when there is a null pointer to produce a error message and um, some stupid uh, codes do things like throw a null pointer and catch it and it will be slower. But you don't do this, yes? <laughs> Hopefully not. Okay, so now <laughs> um, we go to Loom. Another subject. Yeah, basically the idea of uh, how many people are using uh, async uh, framework or uh, reactive framework here. Uh, not yeah. not a lot. Format so so basically uh, we, uh, we want to explain you why you should not do this. But so if you, if, you do, do, if you plan to do async, if you don't do it currently and you just plan to do it, don't do it. Just wait for loop. Is, is it the message you want to... Yeah, but to don't forget that the first slide we said, don't believe us. Yeah. <laughs> so basically what we want to steal is Erlang actors. Um, the fact that... Um, uh, you can have a code that run that uh, work like a kind of thread, but is not bound to a system thread. So threads are more lightweight than uh, processors, but they are kind of heavyweight. Um, uh, if you take a look, we have uh, in Java uh, all the synchronized or reentrant lock that are lightweight. Um, 
So in the VM, the whole uh, locking mechanism is done by, by the VM, by the application, not by the kernel. So it's fast, but at the same time, uh, creating a thread has a real cost. Um, mostly, you have to reserve um, a new stack, so a bunch of memories, and the scheduling is done by the OS, which means that each time uh, you transition from a, uh, one thread to another, you have a context switch. How, how much amount of memory does this thread represent? In general, um, it's about one megabyte? Uh, so, yeah, uh, I think by default, the, 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 the size of the stack is one megabyte. Um, I don't remember if it's one or four. I think it's but, one. Yeah. I think it's four if you, if you are in C and one, yeah. one in Java. So basically the idea of Loom is uh, to be able to have a kind of lightweight thread. Uh, if you take a look to the current uh, thread model, so we have several threads, T1, T2, T3. If you want to use a lock, you will uh, talk to the VM, so in the same application, but the whole scheduling is done by, by the OS. And uh, the model we uh, uh, that Loom is promoting is what we call the continuation uh, model. And the idea is that the whole scheduling can be done by the application. Um, there are basically two main uh, reasons for doing this. The first one is if the application does the scheduling, it can do a better scheduling than the OS because he knows the problem of the application. It's what you have when, when you use the actor framework, for example. If you use the actor framework, you have a specific uh, uh, frameworks and uh, you can do a better scheduling because you know that if you send a message to an actor, you want to schedule it first or this kind of thing. So basically doing the scheduling in the application uh, will enable uh, uh, us to have a better scheduler. And the other thing is in terms of uh, memory cost. Uh, instead of having big uh, uh, chunk of memory for each thread, you can only um, uh, pay for what you are using instead of pre-reserving something. That's, that's basically the, the idea of the continuation model. So what is a continuation? A continuation is something that wrap a runnable, exactly like, like, like a thread. And uh, instead of starting a thread, you can run a continuation. It will execute the runnable. And inside the runnable, um, um, you have a special call, uh, which is the, the, the name of the call is yield. And uh, if you yield, you will go out of the continuation and uh, continue uh, the code after the run. And if run is called again, you will restart just after the yield. So it's, it's like a function, but you can go out of the function in the middle of the function and restart from where you, you were uh, at some point. Uh, one, th one thing which is great with this model is that it's just an API model. Uh, you provide a new class named continuation, and, and that's all. There, there is no need for uh, a keyword support or things like this. So uh, maybe you want to explain the code. I will just switch to the demo. Okay, um, yeah, this is exactly the same code. Uh, so we have a scope, we, we will not explain what a scope is, but um, you can create a continuation and you pass a runnable, this is uh, my, my lambda, and it will print hello devox and do a yield and I just 
uh, have a start continuation here. And if I just run the code, it will print start continuation and hello devox. Really like if I run the, um, the runnable. But what can I do is do something like this and and here run the continuation again. And if I run this code, uh, I will have start continuation, run, and run goes inside the continuation, print hello devox, yield, go back into the main, print run it again, and go inside the continuation. So wh what you're showing here is that a task, a continuation is basically a task. Yeah, you know, okay. This model in the head, kind of. And the task can, can tell to the thread that is currently running that task, I have to wait for something, I, ne I need to stop for something, I need yeah. to pause. So pause me, the thread can take the hand once again, remove the, this task from the thread, and run it again on the, on the later. Yeah, so, so, so basically when you do a yield, you have a, uh, a magic operation that will freeze the stack and offload it. And so you can continue to run your main. Uh, uh, everything is done in one thread. There is no several thread. Everything is done in one thread. And um, so you, uh, what yield does is freezing, basically, is, um, as a the stack and storing it. So that two new things that you can't do for currently with the current uh, concurrent programming model in Java, a task can cancel itself and a thread can handle several tasks at the same time, one by one. Yeah, yeah. if you freeze something and put it uh, somewhere else, out, somewhere somewhere else. Some uh, it's on, uh, on the heap basically. Um, yeah, you can schedule another uh, continuation if you want. Great. All right. So yeah, this is basically what you just run. In yeah. Fact. So this is how it works. Um, you have your stack with main that call run, that call a function f1, that call a function f2. And when you yield, you copy the stack uh, on the heap, basically. It what's it's what the VM does. Mm. Uh, it's a little more complex than copy because uh, you need to copy and you need uh, to uh, provide a way for the GC to find all objects you are using on the stack. Uh, otherwise, uh, the object will disappear <laughs> when you go back, <laughs> which is not a great, uh, great way. And so when you go back... Um, um, it's not working at all. Yep. Uh, when you go back, there is a kind of optimization, which is instead of copying the whole uh, stack again, uh, the VM will try to not copy the whole stack, but copy some part of the stack, some stack frame, and introduce, uh, you can see a red stack frame, which is a, um, basically a page which is uh, non-readable. The idea is uh, you don't have to copy the whole, um, the whole uh, stack frames, but just one or two uh, stack frames because you know that you will uh, only go, uh, usually you only uh, go on these uh, stack frame. And if you uh, go out, uh, the VM will copy more information. So it's, it's a kind of um, copy if you use it or not. Um, so yeah, it's a way to optimize uh, the whole things, and um, basically because it's a VM, the VM can see how you are using the program and uh, decide how many stack frame um, need to be copied. Oh, <laughs> 
So, um, if if we um, uh, make a di uh, try to make a difference or try to think uh, what are the difference between a continuation and a thread, um, the, the the real difference is that uh, with a continuation you will do the scheduling by yourself. You can write your own scheduler um, using a continuation, which means that you can. Uh, create your own framework that will schedule your continuation the way you want it. Uh, you don't pay any cost uh, for the context switching. Everything is done by the application. And there is no uh, heap uh, reservation um, by default. You only store when you, uh, when you yield something, which means that if you don't yield uh, on something because you, you you don't want to block on something, uh, the, the cost is zero, basically. So another uh, another demos um, on top of uh, continuation, um, we have uh, what we call. Uh, the fibers. So this is an example of uh, of a proxy. I mean, uh, uh, a TCP uh, proxies that read some value and write it. Uh, believe me, it's a proxy. <laughs> and this is how you create uh, the proxy. But basically, what you do here is you are creating two thread to proxy the data from, uh, you read from one point and write in the other and do the opposite. Uh, for the, because uh, TCP connections are uh, duplexed. So if I run this code, it will start. And if I do a net cat on it, I can say foo. Oh, then uh, I will create a TCP connection on the port 7. I don't know if you know what the port 7 does. Usually it does nothing because it's not open. But <laughs> this is uh, uh, um, uh, on, on this laptop, it's open. Well, basically, it's not on this laptop, it's uh, in France, but somewhere else. <laughs> somewhere else. Um, so if, if you take a look here, you see that you have two threads thread 0 and thread 1 that do the proxying things. And now I want to show you the same code, but using another abstraction uh, named fibers. What a fiber is, is basically a kind of lightweight thread. It's built on top of continuation. And the idea is, when you do uh, a blocking operation, like a read, a write, a sleep, or something like this, uh, instead of really blocking the thread, you will yield from the continuation and use another continuation. Which means that if you have fibers, you can have several fibers for only one thread. Basically, have the Erlang model. So uh, the way you schedule a fiber is, um, so you can create a fiber inside a fiber scope, and inside the scope, uh, the, um, all fiber will end the scope end. But here, uh, what we want is just have a kind of... Uh, uh, um, we don't want to have a, a fiber scope. So basically, we have a special scope named background, which say it will run forever, uh, I mean, like a thread. And you schedule you know, things. You, you need to have an executor. Here's the executor I'm using. It's just the one, uh, uh, an executor with, with only one thread uh, to be sure that only one thread will be used. And if I run uh, this code, I have a very similar things. And I will write foo and bah. It works the same way. But if you take a look, everything is done 
in exactly the same thread. Because when you have a blocking operation, when, by example, my proxy is waiting uh, for uh, the user to enter something, it's blocking on the read. So it can schedule the write or do other things. The thing which is great is um, that if you take a look to the code, the code of the proxy is exactly the same. It's exactly the same code. Which means that uh, you can use an existing code that do read and write. You can use a library code somewhere and just say, instead of creating threads, I will just creating fibers. And suddenly, uh, all my code uh, will be uh, uh, able to have several fibers inside one thread. <laughs> so what a fiber is, a fiber is really uh, a kind of lightweight thread. So it's wrapper runnable, it's scheduled by an executor, a fiber can move from one thread to another. Basically, when, when you stop a fiber, it will yield the continuation, and the continuation can be restarted on another thread. So it means that fiber are able to move from a thread to another thread. Basically, we say uh, you have thread and you, uh, uh, you have uh, fibers and you have carrier thread. And at a point, a thread has only one fiber. But when you have a blocking operation, the, the fiber can be unmount and another fiber can be used. So for each blocking call, read, write, sleep, whatever, uh, the, the fiber is free, uh, freezed, descheduled, and another one is used. The great thing about this is that it's fully integrated in the GDK, which means you have to do nothing, just use another GDK, a uh, 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 loom-enable GDK, and it works already. Um, you, you may have to change how you create your thread. You may have to change the thread pool. Saying, no, I don't want a thread pool. I want a, a fiber-aware thread pool. But basically, all blocking call in the GDK have been written to be fiber-aware. To say, oh, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, is my current thread uh, uh, have a fiber on top of it? If it has, I will deschedule it in directly in the application. Uh, so uh, it's a work in progress because obviously it means that you have to rewrite a bunch <laughs> of the GDK uh, to be fiber aware. That, that if it started already, right? We had yeah, yeah, yeah. Patches it, in, it in has, NIO, for instance. For two yes, hours. and uh, and if you take a look to um, um, you have some patch that have already uh, been uh, applied on the GDK mainline. Um, basically, uh, uh, all I/O are now using the NIO framework on the underneath, and so it's easier to be fiber aware because you just have to patch the NIO things, mm. and it works for uh, for everybody. Uh, there are some uh, limitation currently. Um, in Java, you can call a C function, and the C function can call itself a Java function, which means that on the stack, you have in the middle of the stack a C stack, and uh, <laughs> C doesn't like the stack to be copied somewhere and copies back in another address. Weirdly, uh, I don't understand why. <laughs> uh, so if, if you have a, uh, a C uh, stack frame in your middle of, of your code, uh, currently it means that the fiber will be only rescheduled on the same thread 
it comes from. So the address will be exactly the same. The address uh, of the stack will be exactly the same. So uh, this is um, uh, a, a limitation. Another one is, is uh, uh, if you use synchronize currently. So in Java, you have two, uh, two ways to do uh, uh, a kind of synchronize. Either you use a, a keyword synchronize, or you use a real-turn clock. And in the VM currently, uh, <laughs> synchronize uh, is using uh, assembly code, and the round front lock is using Java code and pray that the JIT will do <laughs> things correctly. So currently, only the round front lock are patched. So basically, if you lock a round front lock and you don't have the lock, it's a blocking operation and you will be descheduled. But it's not the case for synchronized currently, just because it's not implemented. Um, it, it will be implemented in the future. But maybe it will mean to re-implement synchronize in the VM to have a, a Java implementation because it's far easier if uh, if it's a Java implementation. Uh, currently, there are some trouble with the uh, current API, which is what thread dot current thread mean exactly. Because usually uh, people try to use a hash map that say for the current thread I will do something. Um, so currently, uh, since two weeks, uh, the, um, the API model has changed a little bit. The idea is instead of having a class fiber, uh, the idea is to try to reuse the class thread. And basically say, instead of having a uh, heavyweight thread and a lightweight fiber, let's try in terms of API to have only one class thread and have two kinds of thread. The heavy thread, which yeah, are yeah. the system thread, and the lightweight version, which are just lightweight thread. So just have a Boolean to say if I want to uh, an heavy thread or a lightweight thread. Um, because in that case, thread.current thread will return the lightweight thread, which is what you want. And uh, exactly for the same thing, when you do an interrupt, you want to interrupt the lightweight thread and not the carrier thread. Um, I think, uh, I don't know if you have this, this bug, but currently you have this bug when, when, you, when you use an executor and you interrupt one thread because you are, you are using an executor, you can interrupt one thread, it will, uh, but if the runnable that run the thread doesn't check the interrupt status, it will be another one that will get the interrupt status, which is a, a kind of dumb thing to do. And um, <laughs> the idea of the model is to have one million lightweight thread. To, uh, to be able to run. Um, this causes trouble when you have thread local, because if you have, uh, let's say, when uh, 1,000 uh, thread, having thread local, I mean, yes, you, you're losing memory, but not a lot of memory, but when you start to having 1 million lightweight thread, if each one is using several thread locals, it means a lot of memories. Um, so um, uh, in terms of Loom, we are trying to find a way uh, to uh, store the thread local inside the stack of the uh, lightweight thread on the fiber, basically, um, to have more space. Uh, because currently, the current implementation store everything as an object. And things like this, it's, so you have a lot of boxing, so you pay a kind of cost. Um, so that's one problem is that uh, a lot of libraries are using thread locals, uh, and uh, if you want to interrupt with this library and have one million lightweight thread, you have to find a way to have a compact representation of uh, this thread. 
So currently there is an early access prototype. This is uh, the one I have used uh, for the demo. We are trying to find the right API. Uh, one thing which is uh, a little uh, uh, scary for me is that not a lot of people are on the mailing list, but it will change your future. <laughs> so please, please, please join the mailing list and ask things, ask why, test. Uh, you have your application. Uh, you can create lightweight thread and test. Test if it works. Test if your API, uh, if, if your uh, application is compatible with it. Just do a small test. I mean, take, take your Friday, <laughs> say to your manager, I want to test Loom. <laughs> Get some karma point. And try to convince him or her. <laughs> no, 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 just, just test and report. Uh, um, because this is a kind of feature where it's easy to be isolated from the real world and to not see uh, some use cases. Maybe you could say two things. First, the Loom project is available on GitHub. It's one, one of the branches yes, yes. of the JDK that has been moved from the Mercurial repository uh, to GitHub. Yeah. So, you can so, so, you so, really so, can so better, a, you can even... Yeah, build your JDK for <laughs> right, GitHub, uh, and you are providing request. you are providing a GitHub repo with updated builds of, of the Loom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested but in yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, uh, I'm, I'm I'm doing a tool in action this afternoon on this this topic about how to build your own branches of the JDK to test those features. Yeah, but so if you're in that, you can. But you can check test early class prototype. And basically, every something like two weeks or. Uh, you have a new binary version. And um, again, um, uh, testing it is really, really easy. Uh, you, you just install it like any other GDK. And usually it's something like you change five or ten lines of code and just play with it and see uh, how it works. Uh, in terms of performance, it's, not, uh, it's still a prototype. Uh, we know that some part are not that great. Uh, if you compare, by example, um, uh, Kotlin coroutine with uh, Loom uh, implementation, uh, with Kotlin you, you have the issue that you have to have some uh, to add some um, uh, keyword to say this method is not a real method; it's a coroutine method and things like this. So it's far easier to use. Uh, um, uh, Loom that to use any other uh, coroutine libraries because you don't have to change your code basically. You don't have to change the application code. You just have to change the thread pool that is used or things like this. So uh, no version of Java is targeted, um, but w we hope that uh, in let's say uh, two years. Uh, it will be integrated in the GKE, perhaps under a flag, but um, um, even if the performance are not uh, fully in there, it can be integrated in the GDK, uh, because it's far easier to use that to use any async or any reactive application. Great. And that's all for Loom. That's all for Loom. Amber. <coughs> That's a Picasso paintings, by the way. Copied from Velasquez, but still made by Picasso. So yeah, uh, Amber come from Ascos pattern matching. A Amber, so far, Amber has generated quite a lot of new features in the JDK, uh, including the var keywords. There are several points to the, to the language that are developed under the, the, amber, the, the amber umbrella. But the final goal of Amber is to introduce the pattern matching in a way it has been implemented in ASCO. So yeah, this is the abstract type in ASCO. So yeah, basically the idea is just to steal another great things for another um, 
less great language. Um, the Picasso. <laughs> <laughs> um, so currently, um, uh, sometimes you have a hierarchy or some things. Uh, la uh, things some, just a simple hierarchy like a JSON hierarchy. When you do a JSON parsing, either you get a JSON object or you get a JSON array. And um, and if you want to react on this kind of things currently in Java, you do a bunch of if instance of on the on the whole object, because there is no way to just say, oh, um, my function for uh, um, uh, things like this my function for a JSON object or my function for a JSON array uh, are different. So the ultimate goal, um, it's not the final syntax, it's just uh, for uh, you to understand what what is the goal. But the goal is uh, to take a hierarchy of things, it can be an object hierarchy or it can be something like an expression here, hierarchy, when you have value and add that implements the expression. And the idea is to uh, enhance the switch to be able uh, to do a switch on type, basically. And to say, if it's this type, I will do this operation. If it's the other type, I will do another operation. Basically, to have uh, pattern matching in Java. Uh, currently, the, the, the way you can uh, do this kind of thing in Java is to use a visitor pattern. But usually, uh, when you start to think, well, I will use a visitor pattern, now you have two problems. The one you want to solve and the visitor pattern itself. Not always easy to know which one. <laughs> and and the, the other thing is to try... Um, so. Uh, in a way, it's copying Haskell, but it's also copying um, uh, Scala or Kotlin that have a kind of uh, equivalent feature. Uh, but uh, one goal is to make it fast. Um, basically, the idea is if, if you uh, do a, a classical call or if you do a switch on type, it should be exactly the same cost. It should be a refactoring that you programmer decide if you want to have the thing inside the hierarchy or not. Basically, if you want to control the hierarchy or if you don't want to control it. So uh, this is the battle plan for Amber. Um, the idea is to, uh, because the GDK uh, now has faster release, um, we'll have several features that at the end <laughs> get uh, the, the, the full pattern matching. So first introduce a switch expression, a switch that can return a kind of value. Um, then to have a da data class and seal type. So a data class is a, um, basically if, if you take a look to the code here, you see that you have some get v and get l. One problem of the pattern matching is that because you are not inside the hierarchy anymore, it means that you can access to the field directly. You have to have some getter or something like this. So the idea of the data class is to have some getter automatically for uh, okay, some kind of, of type and uh, to have a way to say, uh, um, uh, for for the switch, if you take a look here, I have no default case because I want a way to say uh, an expression can be a value or an add, but not anything else. So restricting the, the subtype of an interface. And then uh, implement the type switch. Um, you have two things to implement. Change the switch to be able to switch on type and uh, change instance of to be able to switch on type. To, and then implement what we call the deconstructor, which is a way to avoid to have the getters, but to, have to say, I have m this object and I want to extract all the data from it. 
uh, with a separate um, uh, representation from the data internally and externally to keep uh, encapsulation. So first, change switch to uh, introduce um, the expression switch. Um, at the same time, um, we want to change um, the switch. Uh, we try to want to uh, have a better switch. Um, uh, usually, wh when you reopen a feature, you you, you try to um, uh, improve it at the same time. So, what are the pain point of the current switch? Uh, first, it's mostly alien to C. Let's put it that way. Uh, usually in C, when you have one expression, you can put it. If you have several one, you will put the several uh, instruction inside a block. If you take a look to the switch, there is no such thing. Uh, mostly because uh, People in the early day of C uh, see the switch as a b just a bunch of go tos. So uh, this is the first uh, issue. The issue is this break thing that obviously you will forget. So we want to try to get rid of the fall through rule that one uh, thing uh, falls through to another. But uh, here, um, we still want to have uh, these two cases going into the same um, uh, same block of code. And the other one is, um, here you can do this kind of things. Color equals null. And it works. <laughs> Uh, basically, the scoping rule in uh, in the switch are uh, just fully stupid. <laughs> so we want to fix that at, at the same time. So uh, uh, basically, we have two things. One is to improve the switch, and the other one is uh, to have a switch that can, can return a value. So how to improve? The switch. So the first thing is to say, I don't want to have break, I want to have uh, a block of code. So the idea is to say here, I want to have a kind of a block of code. Obviously, it doesn't work well, so reuse the arrow syntax of, of, the, of the lambda. Notice it's not a lambda. It, we are just reusing the arrow syntax of the lambda. It's not a new function in the middle. It's just I want to group uh, several things. Um, so here you have an issue, but you can say something like, oh, sorry, like this. Let's group and separate all the cases using a comma. So here my ID say, oh no, you are using, oh no, it says something else. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's fully implement the whole things and like this. Did I already have the, so here I have the right message, I hope, yes. It say, oh, this is a preview feature, and a preview feature. I will put it here. Yeah. Currently, a preview feature. Um, uh, you have two things. Uh, the first one is uh, it will generate a dot class with the minor version of the dot class that say it's a preview feature, which means that you will not be able to use. Uh, currently, I think it's GDK uh, 13. Um, if I try to use this class with GDK 14, it doesn't work. Because the preview feature is only for one GDK. It's not um, 
backward compatible with other uh, uh, version. So here I have solved both of my problems. Now I have block with real uh, scoping rules and I have no fall through anymore because I have uh, the block things. And now what I want is um, basically to use the expression switch, which is I can return this thing and consider it as an expression, which means that here I can use something like this and and here I am in trouble <laughs> um, because here I have two uh, operation to do so I can do this it will work but basically return escape the wall method it will work in my example do you mean that the return exits the method and, and you would yes. like it to... Yes, here the switch return only. doesn't escape the, um, uh, the, the switch. block. Yeah. It escapes the whole method. So we have to introduce a new keyword and the keyword is yield. Why it's yield? Why not? I mean, the main issue with syntax is that... Uh, you, you should not discuss syntax. Um, uh, if you take a look to the mailing list, uh, the whole expression switch was solved in something like six months and one year and a half was about what keyword we will put here. <laughs> so after a lot of discussion, technically, if you take a look to uh, the, uh, the switch expression for uh, GDK 12, it's using break instead of yield, but it was a kind of ugly to uh, read con a break to mean another thing. So it's yield, and yield is, a, is not a real keyword. It's a keyword which is enabled only inside, inside uh, um, an expression switch, which means that you don't have to rewrite all your code that using yield as a method name or as a, uh, a local variable name. Field. <laughs> and, and the rule are, are quite simple, which is basically if you are inside an expression switch, yield mean yield as a keyword. Outside, it mean yield uh, either as a, a, a local variable name or as a method name or even as a class name. And that's all. Um, the, the other thing you can do is uh, do this kind of switch. Instead of doing it on, um, uh, on string, you can do it on um, um, on, on the enum, which is on top. So I can write this thing like this. Uh, value of and do the switch on the enum. So obviously now this thing are just the enum. Things and one thing which is great is this. For an enum, the compiler knows all the possible value, so it will do uh, an exhaustive check to see if all the values are covered. And if all the values are covered, you don't have to put a default. And this is a, a very important feature, in fact. The thing is, if you add a new foo here, it doesn't, the switch doesn't compile anymore. Which is really important. It means that um, 
uh, if you write a default, it will go into the default, and your your your, um, uh, your program will not handle the uh, new enum value correctly. Uh, if you don't have a default, it will not compile. So you know every uh, uh, location uh, where you have to fix the whole things. Um, which means that um, if you want to do the, uh, we want to do the switch on type. I mean, this is our target. And we want to introduce a mechanism to be able to see, to, to say only this type can appear in the switch. But what, what, so I guess I will have an exception if my enumeration is, a, is in a project and my yeah, switch is in another project. Yeah, and you, uh, you have an error. There is an expression. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I don't remember, but it's something like in, incompatible class change error. Okay. Which is... So I cannot hack the system, basically. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, um, <laughs> usually in Java, you have the compiler and you have the VM and the VM doesn't trust the compiler at all. <laughs> Okay. All right. So that's for the switch. Yeah. So uh, first, as, uh, with the expression switch, we are fixing the error of the past, which means that you can use. Uh, you don't have to return an expression to use the new switch with the arrow. Y you can already use this. So no fall through, no weird scoping things. Then we now have the uh, expression switch uh, to return values. And um, it's a preview feature for 12 and 13. And in 14, so uh, uh, in March, uh, it will not be a preview feature anymore. So that's one of the new things we'll get in, uh, in 14. Great. Yeah. Seal types. So seal types. Basically, the idea of seal types is to be able to enumerate all the possible subclass of uh, usually an interface. So when you switch on them, the compiler can verify that you have covered all the cases. But then it, it yeah, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. So um, this is uh, the seal type using the Kotlin syntax, technically. Uh, Kotlin copy it from Scala. So it's a double steal. We're stealing it from Kotlin that stole it from Scala. Yes. And uh, uh, the thing is that uh, now when, when you show a slide with Scala, people just say, oh, it's Scala. <laughs> <laughs> but it's basically exactly the same feature. Um, so we have two parts in it. Um, we have the seal type uh, part. Uh, the idea is uh, when you seal an expression, you say my wall uh, hierarchy will be closed and I will only uh, uh, allow uh, certain uh, subtype. Uh, this is basically a great feature. Um, uh, currently in Kotlin, the VM doesn't care about the seal keyword because Kotlin doesn't change the VM. But one thing which is great is uh, if the VM knows this kind of thing, it can do further optimization. And uh, we need to have some data class. So what a data class is, is just uh, basically um, uh, in Java, uh, as encapsulation is king, which is by default, you have to have a different representation for the internal state and the external API. But for a lot of classes, you don't want that. Basically, if your uh, class is just a carrier of data, something like I get it from JSON, uh, to take my running example, um, usually when I deserialize something from, uh, from JSON or XML or, or whatever, uh, uh, um, encoding uh, I have, it's just data. And for this kind of uh, class, we, we don't have uh, such support. Obviously, the idea is um, 
uh, to have support of data class so we will be able to do a switch on them and to be able to extract all the value of the data class automatically. So this is uh, what we will do in Java. As you see, it's fully different from Kotlin. We have the seal keyword. Um, so currently you have a permit keyword where you can list all, uh, all the thing. All the types that can... Uh, all the types, yeah, that can appear. And you have the record keyword that will basically create a kind of data class with a very similar syntax, weirdly. Um, you have two kinds of sealed things. Uh, you use permit if um, uh, everything is in several different uh, .java files, but if everything, I mean the interface and all the record are in the same Java file, the compiler will infer automatically all the permit uh, uh, clauses for you. Do, do I need to use the record keyword here? Or no, 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 it I works for, for class. Can it be or a class or abstract oh. class? Yes. Okay. Yeah, already. And um, uh, the other thing is that by default, a record is a static. Uh, there is a difference. Um, in Java, stupidly, when you create a class inside a class, you have to put static in front of it. Otherwise, you have a, a, a back pointer. And for records, there is no such kind of back pointer things. Yes. So it works the same as interfaces and uh, enumerations? Yeah, if for, for enum, you have exactly the same thing. If, if you create an enum inside something, yes. you don't have the, boy, the back pointer. It's so static by default. Yeah. So um, this is how it works. If you seal an interface, automatically all the hierarchy is sealed, which means that uh, rec the record or the class are final. Uh, automatically, you can see the class sub here is. Uh, um, you you don't have to put final in it. It will be uh, the, the compiler will put final automatically. And for the interface inside, the interface that are inside the hierarchy, the seal keyword is propagated automatically. Which is not the default in Scala and cause a lot of trouble because of that. So we have a special keyword name, non-sealed, <laughs> if you want to have a sealed class but with some open things on the side. We really hope that nobody will use it, but it exists. So basically, the idea of seal type is to be able to define a closed hierarchy. Uh, as, um, this feature has two sides, one in the compiler and one in the VM. Again, the VM will do the check uh, to verify that you cannot load something uh, which is not declared in the permitted subtypes. Or create some th something at runtime with well, as runtime with an agent or this kind so of So yeah, things. basically, if you see it's scheduled for Java 15, um, the feature is already ready, but some people are using some mocking framework and currently we have no... Uh, I mean, if you list all the subtypes and the VM check it at runtime, you are in big trouble with mocking frameworks. Basically, so we have to open a small door somewhere for this <laughs> mocking framework. And that's why it's not in 14, but in 15. Great. And yeah, basically the idea uh, from the pattern matching point of view is to avoid to have the default uh, in the switch when you do a switch on type. Great. And you just talked about the record, which is, a, we could say it's a new model for for beans, for Java beans, should it, could it could it replace Java beans at some point? Uh. Bas basically, a record is a is a class that you just declare in that way: record user, string name, and int age. This is the declaration of the record. It lives in a in a user .java file, and uh, and that's all you need to, to put in that file to declare a record. So, record is very light syntax that both declares the type itself 
as a kind of a class, and also the, the, the elements of this, of this class, the, the properties uh, of this class. So here we have just a basic user with a name and uh, an age. And everything will be generated for us uh, at compile time, directly by the compiler. All right. So we'll have the, the right constructor that is going to take the two, the two parameters declared in this user signature. You could call it like that, I guess. But also the, the different accessors. Now the, the accessors are not going to be uh, getters um, in, in a classical way, we, we, we understand it. It will not be get name and get age, but rather name and age. And since the, the name and age property are going to be final, uh, there won't be uh, a need for to put setters, uh, setters in it. Now, if you want to override the name and the age to do some validation or this kind of thing, it's also possible there is a, the syntax is open to, to do this kind of thing. And it will also generate, which is really nice, the equals, the hash code, and the two-string method. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, that's, that's like 60, 70 lines of code that we will not have to write anymore <laughs> when creating a, or generate uh, when creating a, a Java bean class. Um, yeah, but it's not a Java bean class, because a uh, Java bean class, you have getters and setters. Mm. And if you take a look here, you have getters and and getters. Well, see, since it's immutable, you don't really need yes. setters, right? You could you could add setters just to throw illegal argument exception or something <laughs> just for the fun of it. But yeah, we no, it's not it's not supported. So basically, the idea is um, uh, for uh, framework that were uh, that want to uh, use record. The idea is to use a canonical constructor mm. to create. The whole things yeah. instead of creating an empty object and call set, adding, on all, uh, adding all stuff to it, yeah. which makes a, a lot of sense. Uh, if you need to do some validation, you can also override the default constructor. Um, that just say, for instance, yeah, the name should not be null, so I can just call objects require non-null in uh, in using this syntax, just to make uh, to make sure that. Yeah, all the, the instances of user are going to be valid. It's uh, it's not a great syntax because as you can see, it's not a real constructor. You don't have the parentheses. Everybody see that? No, no, it's a typo. It's a typo in a <laughs> No, 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 it's <laughs> not. <laughs> it's not at all. <laughs> and um, uh, what it means is the validation will be added in the canonical constructor. So you don't have to write this.foo equals foo. It will be do it for you, and it will do the validation. Basically, before. So this is, the, this is the current syntax. Can it change yet? Can it change? Um, no. No, no, okay. no, 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 no. <laughs> so if you're not happy with this syntax, you need to be very vocal to change it um, now. Yeah, yesterday <laughs> you, sh you should have been vocal. Shout louder. All right. Oh, you have a demo for that. Yeah, we Great. have one. And so um, we have our interface vehicle, and we have a car here. Basically, a car have a color, and I have a constructor, and I have a getter, and I have an equals, and a an hash code, and a two string. And basically, the idea is you can remove everything here and just say it's a record, record. Obviously, my ID will have some trouble with the syntax. Um, it was a, co uh, a string color. And so, where am I? Um, you are in I the L world. The recall things. I have a, s a build script. <laughs> and it just works. OK. Yeah, when you write a shell script, it's faster than using Maven. 
So here you have you are using a, a JVM that you built yourself because there's no preview version of uh, no there is no feature. preview version of Amber. There's, there's no available VM on the JDK uh, web, uh, website with a pre-built VM to test this feature. Yeah, be, because the whole plan is to stuff it in Java 14, so right. <laughs> soon uh, it will be available as a, as a preview feature. So. Yeah. Yeah, so here great. I have made a mistake, which is before as a um, uh, the color uh, I had a, a require an mm -hmm. here, so I can use my uh, weird constructor things here and do the objects require an onnul object sorry public. You're fighting against your ID. It's yes. <laughs> Isn't it a requires? Requires. Is it require or require? Uh, let's try. I think so. No, I can't, can't be sure. <laughs> <laughs> and cannot find symbol requires. Let's say require. Require? It's where do you see that? Okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I messed up. So yeah, my bad. Uh, so yeah, currently this syntax is not that great, but um, anyway, it works. So if you take a look to the um, record example here, I just print the car, and it will print the car like this, which is the default um, a two string, and I can ask for the hash code here and obviously it will print the hash code which is this one very interesting um <laughs> well, yes it is <laughs> it's quite important to have a hash code <laughs> yeah it's important to have one but when you see the value it's not that important okay um basically um the algorithm that will be used for uh, two string equals and hash code are not fixed they are uh, they can change uh, on the gdk basically they are implemented by the gdk you 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 can't have it uh, i will show you uh, 14 um, GDK GDK yeah I have a lot of <laughs> nice collections of JDKs you have yeah and I have a special one for Devox oh great and if you take a look to Java P of K uh, everybody knows what Java P does. Java P would just list the. Uh, it dumps the, 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 the corresponding bytecodes. Uh, so it's not that interesting. But uh, so you can see that uh, the accessor is doing a get field to get the field, which is something logic. But if you take a look to equals. We will see that equals it's not implemented. Basically, what equals does is calling the GDK and say, help me, please. Which means that even if you compile your record with one version of the GDK, the uh, equals or hash code or two string uh, will be implemented by the GDK itself. But the, you mean by the GDK running your code? Yeah, running your code so and if not you the compile one in compiling 14? your code. So if you compile in 15 and run in 20, the, the yeah. version of the hash code you will run is the 20th version yes. and not the 15th one. Which means that you can have, we can have a better version of hash code depending on uh, new, new features version. from yes. the JVM. And the other thing is that it makes the code smaller. So the wall, um, that, that's the main difference between the mm -hmm. data class in Kotlin and, and the you, you mean the class file itself? Yes, yeah, the it. class file itself. Because you have just this call to invoke. Yeah, you, you just say GDK help me. Yeah. And the other thing is um, because the GDK knows the VM, it can do some really nasty optimization. <laughs> um, nice. 
Uh, currently, by the way, there is no optimization, so it's the opposite. <laughs> if you call, if you write your own equals, it will be faster <laughs> than if you use the GDK one. But it may change soon. All right. So of course, this. Oh, since yeah, I've this forgotten this demo. What have you forgotten? <laughs> I have a nice demo if I want to uh, do. Uh, uh, I yes, want to take my record you're and. Still on the slide, uh, Remy. Hmm? Which button? You're still on the slide. Oh. That's better. Yeah. So uh, here I have a two JSON that take an object. Uh, it's just to show that a record is not only. Uh, something that generates getters and equals and hash code, but it also provides a reflection API that you can use if you want to implement something like two JSON that take an object. So first, if I have the class, I can ask uh, to uh, if it's a record or not using ears record, which is kind of obvious. So that, that's a new method on the on the class. Uh, yeah. Class named class, right? Yes. Um, you, you can see how it's implemented, by the way, if you if you go in it, and you will see that it's asking the VM, is it a record or not? Where is this uh, is record zero method? Oh, it's a native method. Okay. Usually the one that ends with zero inside the GDKR, um, right? it's native. Native. So here, what I can do is do something like this array dot stream. I will. So I, if I have a class which is a record, I can ask get the not component type the record component. So I can ask the record component. So the record components are in fact the property of the of the record. Yes. The, the record, name, component, the is the color, record component is the official name. It's not property, it's record component. Fully different. So I can uh, get the uh, record component, this object, and this object has a nice get accessor method that will give me directly the accessor method that I can call it using invoke here. So I can do things like I will take all the record component, uh, map them, this component to something that will generate the string. So I can ask a component, what is your name? Get name. Or um, if it's in JSON, I have to add some stupid things in front of. And uh, like this, and then I can invoke the accessor on the component and with the object. Um, and I can collect them using collectors.joining and if you want to join something which is in JSON, you will write something like this. So the first parameter is the separator between the different elements and the two others, the prefix and the, and the postfix. And so if I go here and I print my JSON car, I, it should work, and yes. I have great color red. So this is the JSON register we copy paste in a Yeah, so so if I if I take my browser. record car and add an int uh, value Price. here I can just say forty two. Why forty two? I don't know. <laughs> And oh, automatically, great. I get yes. You still need to do reflection on it, Could, couldn't we? You have a, a get value method directly on this record component. And um, uh, it's a 
basically the idea is to have a reflection so you can write okay. one code for all JSON things and not okay. and um, so uh, this is a reflection API and you can use the Java long invoke API too which uh, is more efficient if you call it several times because right. you can pre-prepare the whole uh, expression you want to create okay. so that's all for the reflection API. Ah, great. You're done. <laughs> of course, a record will use this wonderful feature that everybody loves in the JDK, which is called serialization. Yes. The best feature in the world. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, if, you, if you want to have insight on the serialization, by the way, there is a talk that is going to be, to be performed by um, Brian Getz and uh, Stuart Marks on this subject later yeah, during the conference. So I guess you will learn more, and especially why serialization is so interesting in the JDK. It gives a lot of work to a lot of people. So yes, the, the record, uh, record can implement serialization, well, it can be serializable, if you declare the, that uh, explicitly. Uh, it will not use the write object, read object, etc. hacks uh, that have been added to, to override the default mechanisms of serializations, it will directly use the fields and use the canonical constructor to deserialize uh, the elements. Yeah, all right. So in Java 14, we will have uh, records as a, as a preview feature. Yes, in the JDK. as a preview feature. This is what is but, planned currently. But currently, the whole team is uh, is uh, good is a uh, full team on, uh, All on right. this feature. So it's not it's not in a, we we already have preview release of Java 14, right? Do we? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure we do. Oh, you mean yeah, you um, have early access? Yes, early access. Yeah, but the early access doesn't yes, uh, contain it's not uh, currently in the early access, but it should come um, earlier soon. soon. Because you uh, soon, soon the window will be closed, <laughs> so it has to be inside it. Absolutely. As you mentioned, all, everything that pertains to equals hash code and to string uh, will be will be improved in the future. Yeah. So okay, there are issues currently with the performances of those methods in the in the early access build, and uh, maybe we should make the coffee break now. What do you think? Mm, yeah. I think it's the right time to do that. Yeah. yeah. So you will be moved to the second part yeah. of the stuff. Coffee break. Should we take like twenty minutes? Is it okay? Twenty minutes yeah. to have a coffee. All right. Fifteen. Let's say fifteen. Fifty. Okay. Fifteen minutes. So we'll uh, continue at uh, eleven fifteen in fifteen minutes. Thank you for your attention. See you. All right. Here we go. Back again. And during the break, we we've been from Devox Belgium to Devox Belgium because somebody came and added the missing M from the speaker's desk. All right. So let's talk about Groovy's smartcast to have better type inferences and to be able to directly create variables of the right type with the instance of. Yeah, currently it's uh, it's another sad point of of Java, which is when you say x instance of string, then you have to cast it to a string just just after. To and and it's a real sad point because um, if you take a look to the generated code, you will see the cast uh, inside the bytecode. But if you take a look to the assembly code, you will see that the VM is smart enough to remove the cast. <laughs> so it's fully stupid. <laughs> so in fact, the, the VM should be writing our code directly. Instead yes. Of, instead of us, yeah. <laughs> that would be much more I, logical. I think there is a new project on uh, called Skynet or something like this. <laughs> I'm not sure it's really new, is it? <laughs> so, so a way to extend the instead of in <coughs> Java is to um, just add a new uh, variable name at the end of the x instance of string s. So x will st will still be an object, right? X doesn't become yes. a string. We create another variable of yes. type string as part of the instance yes. of another uh, uh, variable which is defined inside the block just after. <laughs> so. um, and um, we have some rules 
And uh, one rule is we don't want to introduce any intersection type. So we will not support the x instance of i or x instance of uh, j. Because I don't know if you know, but uh, there is no intersection type in Java. Uh, I mean, in the in the Java C, inside Java C you have it, but you don't have any surface syntax for it. So uh, it should work if there is a not O instance of point, because a lot of people write this code and we don't want to say, no, now you have to write it in the other way, or these kind of things, which means that it's a little uh, weirder that it should, because in that case, P is not defined inside the block following, but after <laughs> that block, which is a little weird. I mean, I think it's weird the first time you see it, but after you don't care. And obviously we want this kind of things to work too, which is if it's an instance of string and you can use S <coughs> directly in it. If you have an OR, uh, then S is not defined. Uh, basically, for the second example, the, your IDE should uh, warn and say it's stupid to uh, declare here uh, S here. And it works for question mark um, colon, <laughs> obviously. And it even works for while, uh, for basically completeness. But don't write this kind <laughs> of stupid <laughs> things. So uh, it will be a preview feature. Uh, currently, there is no schedule uh, version. Version, but it will be at least uh, 16. 16. So that's March 2021. <laughs> Something like later. That. Later. <laughs> and <coughs> again, later in Java. Uh, 0x1 something. Uh, so 0x means it's hexadecimal? Yes. So it can be up to 15, right? Yes, and uh, to 16 and, and so on. And um, we will add uh, the uh, switch on type. And uh, if you see, we have a special switch on type here because we want to be able to destructure and uh, say a uh, value is composed uh, of a V, and I will declare it as a var. So the compiler will see that the, it's a record, take an int, so the V inside the switch is an int automatically. And uh, with that, we will not have to have any getters and things like this. We will have automatic destructuring of the whole things, and my secret plan, one we have, we have at that point, is to introduce a name tuple. Shh. <laughs> Let's move to Valhalla. Yeah. Next step is Valhalla. Uh, just a slight introduction, Remy. Your, can you remember the first PC you yeah, bought it's with the your first own PC money? I have bought with my uh, own money. Yeah, it was 1993, and I remember 1993, I think it was the release of the first version of that video game called Doom. Yeah, Maybe yeah, yeah. I, I bought it exactly to yeah. play Doom. And Doom, I remember that the, the a regular PC at that time was for megabyte of RAM, not gigabyte, megabyte, really. And Doom was needed... Eight, eight megabytes and yes. generate a so, boom so on the on the sales of, of the, the the four megabytes of RAM yes. in uh, in US and so Europe. so it was a boosted yeah PC. It, it was a, it was a boosted PC that you had at that time. Well, the fact is that at that time, uh, well, PC had less memory, which is which is everybody knows that of course. Now we have uh, much bigger processors with many cores, many threads. Uh, with a lot of memory, 8 gigabytes, 16 gigabytes, 32 gigabytes is kind of mainstreams now. Uh, so basically, the, 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 the fact that to put data in memory 
you need to encapsulate that in objects may pose a problem that was not really the case 20 years ago when Java was released. So Valhalla is, is trying, in fact, to, uh, to address this, this problem, this, which is seen as an issue. Uh, the problem is that when you have uh, especially sets of objects, like lists or arrays of objects, an array list is basically an array wrapped in an object, uh, you have, you, most of the time what you have is, a, is an array of pointer instead of an array of value. And, uh, and there is an overhead uh, due to the fact that the memory is not transferred to the CPU um, randomly. It follows a very precise order, which is a line of memory goes into a line of cache to be as close at the CPU as possible. It was not the, ca the case on your 486. No. Nope. There was no cache on the no CPUs. No cache at all. No cache at all, so it was not an issue. And uh, so, so the idea is to, to lay out the data in a better way even if this data is expressed as a set of objects. We're going to take an example uh, with, with uh, big arrays of, of complex objects. A complex is basically two doubles, a real part and an uh, imaginary part. Uh, if you have uh, an array of complex objects, basically you have an array of pointers. And if your complex is declaring integers instead, uh, doubles, sorry, with a capital D instead of double the value type, then you will have one more indirection uh, to go through. This is called pointer chasing, and pointer, pointer chasing in itself is completely invisible in your code. You don't see pointer chasing, but it has a huge impact on the, 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 the speed at which your, your computation code is going to run. So this is an array of a class complex. In the classical way, it's just an array of references to objects. Each object has an overhead in memory. It has a a declaration of the class, it has a monitor, it has many, many informations because so it's just a code. class. It, it has a hash code. code on it. Absolutely. Uh, so it has an overhead plus this pointer chasing to access the values that are in the complex objects. The idea is to go from this representation in memory to a, to a better layout of the values in memory so that you can iterate very quickly over all those values. Uh, so this this, this Inline object raises several problems. The first one is that a value doesn't have an identity in, in, the, in the sense an object has an identity. Uh, remember in the old days of Java, the, the, the hash code of an object was the address at which th that object was stored. It's not really the case anymore. But you can talk about this kind of thing. When you're talking of, about a value, a value of 10, for instance, 10 can be laid out anywhere in the memory, still 10, right? 10 is, is the identity of, of the value. You don't need any more this kind of thing. There is a second thing is that when you have a value, declare an int, primitive type, an int, an int cannot be null. And now an integer can be null. This is the example you showed with the null pointer exception yeah. uh, and this kind of thing. If you try to unbox an integer that is in fact null, you will get a null pointer exception because, well, because it's just not possible to do that. So if you want to move from a representation in memory with a complex that is an object to a complex that is a value, even if that value has, in fact, two double values, uh, you have those two problems, identity, and you need to deal with nulls, because a complex object can be a null reference, but a complex value cannot be null. So what does it mean to, to go from one, one space uh, to the other? Uh, and you also have this, uh, this way of dealing with values that you, you, you don't really need to know where they are, if they are in, mem in the memory, you know, stuck in, in registers. Uh, back in the, in the old days of C, you could say that the variable was, was to be held in the register, could declare the variable with its register keyword in C. Y you can still Well, you do can that. still do that, yes. The, but the I mean, compiler will just ignore your yes, register but, uh, keyword, but you can still do I it. mean, like 30 years ago, you could do that, yes. and it would make sense to, to say, all right, my, my index, I'm looping over a set of, 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 of uh, the, the cells of an array, and I want that index to be a register to be held in a register because it would be much faster to increment it. Um, so you could do the same kind of thing if you, if you have values. You can do that with values, you cannot do that with, uh, with objects uh, currently. So the right way of, of laying out your complexes in memory would probably be this one. That is just extract the values of the, of the complex objects, which is a double, with a pair of doubles in fact, uh, and, and lay, uh, lay them in, in memory and just in a contiguous uh, 
uh, space in, in a memory. And if, if, you, if you are able to do that, you will win on two sides. First, transferring your, your complex array uh, in a cache so that your CPU can com make computations on them will be much faster. The transfer from the main memory to the cache will be much faster. And then you will also um, win on, on the overhead since you don't have all the, all the header of the class in memory. Yeah. That, that is needed if you have an array of objects. And, and, and that's a lot. GC will be faster too because yeah. there is no pointer anymore. Absolutely. The GC will be happier with this kind of thing. So so this is this reminds me if if you if you if you wrote some C code at some point you might remember the good old days of the type def and the struct stuff. Okay. A struct is just a, a bunch of memory that you lay out in a precise way. Uh, and indeed, the, the idea behind that is to have the same kind of thing as the, as the structs, because it's, it's easier to deal with structs than, to, uh, than with, uh, with objects, if you want to be fast, if you want to compute things uh, faster. So the problem is that, <laughs> what does it mean, uh, uh, what does it mean to, to go from, from complex that are objects uh, to complex that are values. Uh, <laughs> if yes. you, if it's just a value and you you don't have an identity which is the address, then it means that you cannot mutate a value, right? It doesn't doesn't have a sense to say that you can mutate a value. The ten is a ten. You cannot mutate the value ten. Yeah, and and um, uh, so currently in in C is, uh, C is slower than Java because of this. Uh, because when you have an address, in, uh, you, you don't know if it's, it's the same data structure that give you... So here, you don't know if C1 and C2 are the same address in memory or not. Which means that if you change one value, the compiler doesn't know if it changed the other one. So the code that you will generate, the assembly code that you will generate, cannot put things in the register, basically. Mm. And we don't want this kind of thing in Java. So basically, it means that we, um, we don't want to implement struct in Java. We want to implement something which is far simpler, which is basically have only values, as you said, and mm. make them immutable. Well, value by itself is, is not mutable. Two is two, right? You don't have big values of two yeah. and small values of two. Uh, I don't like to talk about values because if you take a look to the spec, <laughs> a reference is a value. So that's why the Gosh. name is inline object and not value object. So basically, an inline object is an object which is able to inline itself in another object. And the name, inline object, it has no identity, no pointer on the heap, not nullable, because you have no pointer, you can not put null in it. <coughs> on stack, it's uh, directly store in register, or spill in, uh, on stack if, if you need. And again, if it's uh, on heap, it means it's in line in another object, either in an array or in an object. Uh, itself. Technically, it's not always uh, in line. So uh, uh, with an inline object, you want the VM to inline the object. But sometimes the VM, the VM cannot inline it. You have several cases. Um, if your object is big, for example, and you have an ar a big array, you will have a big array of big object. <laughs> and it's in that case, it's worse than using pointers. So basically, the VM is uh, able to say, depending on the current hardware you have, I can see the cache line. If my object is bigger than the cache line, it's far better to use a pointer than to try to fit all the data of the inline object. Uh, uh, in memory. Um, currently, if you have a volatile field that and you want to store 
an inline object, a volatile field guarantees that you can load and store atomically something in it. So it has to be a pointer if it's a value which is bigger than uh, uh, 64 bits because the CPU doesn't have a primitive for uh, loading Atomic and storing at yeah. atomically more than 64 bits uh, usually. And currently the prototype doesn't uh, inline the static field, but it's a bug in the prototype. It's a bug of hotspot. Uh, I will explain uh, a little more later. Right. So this is our good old complex class. It has the inline keyword on it in red. Uh, if you want to try Valhalla yourself, there is a preview version of Valhalla currently available on the OpenJDK uh, website. And you can also currently, it's just just to make Eclipse and this kind of usual, useful software happy, you can also add an annotation called the at inline on the class instead of using the inline keyword, which will generate a, a compiler error, of course. So my good old complex with my two variables, well, my two fields, a real part and imaginary part. Nice. So it's just basically a class with the keyword inline, and this inline can be seen as a, as a hint to the VM that this class can be inlined. It's inlineable instead of should be inline. This class uh, may have, uh, sorry, it may implement uh, interfaces. But it cannot but have it, super classes. Yeah. Well, cannot have super classes. And all fields are final. Of course, when you, when it turns out, when you want to inline stuff, you don't want to have cycles because you will blow up your machine very quickly. Anyway, and we have a small demo that has been also shown by uh, Brian Goetz, by the way, which is the Mandelbrot set. Maybe you've all heard about that. So just a hint, it's really Mandelbrot and not Manderbolt, as written on the JDK website. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe people could fix that at some point. <laughs> so basically, it's a set of complexes. Uh, so here we have an HD image. Each pixel does belong to the set or does not belong to the set. So its, it's pixel is in fact represented by a complex number, which is C. And C belongs to the Mandelbrot set if the series you have there, Z, Zn plus 1 equals Zn to the square plus c uh, does not diverge. That is, is bounded for any value of n. So of course, it's quite hard to compute this kind of thing. Um, in fact, if uh, you take a value c and we just compute a certain amount of iteration of z, and if at some point the modulus of z becomes greater than 2, then it's quite obvious to see that this theory is going to diverge. right? So the algorithm is the following. You take an image, whatever the size, 64 by 64 is not that big, but you can start there. And for each pixel, you say, OK, I'm going to compute n value of z and see if all those values stay modulus-wise um, below 2 or not. All right. And if it does, then the point is, is painted in black on the image because it's said that it belongs to the set. And if it's not, we just take the value of n for which the the modulus became greater than, uh, than 2, and this is going to, to give the, the color. So the color is just to, to have a nice representation of it, because uh, a point either belongs to the set or does not belong to the set. There is no, no kind of what distance am I to the set or this kind of thing. It's very hard to compute, in fact, this. So it doesn't, the color is just to, to have a nice representation, cheesy representation of the Mandelbrot set. Yeah. Yeah, I <laughs> like right. the colors. Sorry, oh, we all like colors. Yet, yeah, no problem with that. <laughs> uh, so this is this is the first version of the code, right? It's just a basic double for loop that is going to compute the series starting with zero and starting with a fixed value of c. All right. This is this is the the object version of it, with methods, methods calls, multiply, modulus, this kind of thing. And this is the same code written in a, in a C-like syntax without any object, with just plain uh, regular double values, right? So the, this way of writing the code, uh, th th there is nothing to, to um, I would say, to optimize in, the, in this version of the code because there are no objects. They are just computation of uh, arrays. And the previous one, well, we have objects. We have pointer chasings. We have 
layout that can be optimized in memory to improve the computation of it. I would say that this is the ugly code, and the previous, previous one is, is the nice one with object-oriented abstraction. So usually we assume that object-oriented abstractions are going to give us more readable code than the, than the C-like code. Uh, so how does it work? We just run this code with the JMH, with, which is the, the tool you should be using if you want to measure performances of your code. Oh, of micro benchmark performance. Sorry? My, micro benchmark. Yes, performance. micro benchmark. Uh, using a certain version of the, of the JVM, because of course Valhalla is not released yet, so it's just a preview version. And you see that if you're just using the, the, the primitive types of uh, the primitive version, the C-like version of the code, it runs in, okay, 27 uh, microseconds. And if you use a regular, um, come on, this is not the right one. Hmm? No, it's, uh, you are, it's the right one, but you... <laughs> yes, uh, forget about the integer, it's uh, the integer. It's, not, it's not the integer, it's yes, a Java long complex as an object. Yeah, absolutely. So if you the, the second version, which runs in, in 60 microseconds, is the version that runs uh, with the complex class and no optimization. And the last, the last one is, the, is the, the complex version, which runs with the Valhalla optimization uh, activated. Yeah, with, um, with the current flag. Uh, I will add flag. that uh, currently uh, with GMH, what you see is just the allocation. You don't see the GC at the end because GMH yeah. hide you the, the, the GC. So what you see is not the real cost. What you see is just the cost of the allocation, but you don't see the cost of the, yeah. the allocation. Plus the point of chasing. Yes, but what I'm saying is just that the value in red is better than mm. it is in reality. Yeah. That, that's an optimistic evaluation of yes. the computation without the GC running. And so you see that currently Valhalla reaches the same kind of performance with object-oriented code than the, the C-like code. So it's nice because you have the, the power of the abstraction. This is what you want. You, you want to write readable code, but you don't lose on the, on the, you don't pay the price for the abstraction. You, you have the same performances as the C-like code which is nice. We can try uh, another example, which is the, with the integer class, in fact. So the integer class is not an inline class so far. It maybe it will be in the future, but currently it's not the case. Hello, this is picture time, maybe. You need to make a smile to this guy. <laughs> Thank you. So this, uh, this, is the, this is, in fact, a fake of the integer class written in an inline version. And the, the question is, all right, if we have inline integers uh, and we, we save on pointer chasing, what kind of performance will we get? Which is exactly the, the, the question we need to ask ourselves. Uh, so we are going to take an array, an array of, uh, of int box, so of integers, and we are just going to uh, add all the elements of this, this array, just, just make the sum, ba basic sum reduction of the array. So if we are just having a, an, a, an array of integers, we have pointer chasing and bad layout, so we expect to have lower performances than if we write this code using an array of ints, which is just an array of values. And this is, those are the same, we, we have a mix, we have a, <laughs> those are the exact same uh, performances ah. than the previous one. So I guess that the, 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 the value we showed for the Mandelbrot was not the right one. But anyway, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. So you can see that, okay, so this is, those are the performances for the integer and the ints. And you can see that if we inline integer, we fall back on the same kind of performances as the, 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 the int array. Now, th this is an optimistic way of doing things because every integer that is, that is created is just created after the previous one. And the integer is not such a big object. We can have several integers on the same line of cache. So it means that the pointer chasing on this case by just on this micro benchmark that is creating all the integers on the row uh, will not be that bad in fact. Computer chasing could, could be much worse than, than this case. So the second, second benchmark I'm going to show you is that we create all the integers in contiguous space of memory, integer objects, but we shuffle the collections. 
So then now we have a bunch of pointers that are pointing to any kind of place in memory, and uh, and uh, the pointer chasing would which is going to be much worse in that case than in the previous one. And indeed, if we check the the performances, they are again the same. So this is very warm. <laughs> You have okay. the right numbers. I, I, I Sorry have the right that. one. <laughs> Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah, <laughs> twice as worse. We did. We didn't cheat on it. It's really twice, and it could be. It, I, I'm pretty sure that if you write a bench that guarantees that every integer is on a different line of the memory, you will yeah, have yeah. even worse performance than, than that because the shuffle will randomly put several pointers in the same line. That's for sure. Statistically speaking, it is bound to open in that way. But if you if you write the thing so that every integer is on its own line, you you will have even worse performances. Yeah. Should I continue? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, so um, this is a roadmap to introduce uh, inline uh, classes in Java. First, we have some dependencies with the Project Panama. So the goal of the Project Panama is to uh, um, heal the rift, hence the name Panama, between the C world and the Java world. So no more GNI. It's the, the motto of the project. And in, Pan in Panama, um, oh, uh, the, the project wants to introduce uh, a way to uh, have uh, AVEX um, instruction. Um, I mean, the one when you can do several plus or several loaded things at the same time, use the vector API. And obviously for this, uh, we want things like a, a long uh, 128 bits or thing like this. And we don't want to pay the cost of the object allocation of this kind of object. So currently, Panama is stuck because of Valhalla. <laughs> because we need Valhalla to have lightweight object, or inline object. Um, so Mauricio will do a talk on, on uh, Valhalla and how uh, we stupidly uh, stuck his project. <laughs> the vector API is not Java util vector, right? No, 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 it's a vector in sense uh, instruction a vectorized instruction. Uh, currently, uh, if you use recent version of Java, I think uh, starting with 10 or 11, uh, you have auto, uh, auto uh, vectorization of loop, but you can't write your own vectorization uh, things. So you sometimes you use C for that, and, and it's plainly stupid. So it's. Um, so um, this is the current state of the of the project. Uh, there is a, an early access prototype. Um, uh, currently, this is the third uh, prototype. What we will show you, uh, we have a first prototype named MVT, and this is the second prototype named L World. I will explain why it's L World. And, uh, we'll open and. Um, Currently, uh, for um, we want to release a version inside the GDK. Uh, so we call it L, L World uh, 10. Uh, currently, what doesn't work is uh, uh, we don't have the uh, support for uh, erased generics. I will explain why, but basically, inside the generics, you can put null, and it will not work with inline uh, object. And the final release for L World uh, 100, when we will be all dead, uh, is to uh, have specialized generics. But it means we have to change generics. And we all know that if we change generics, every all code will not work. So it's a kind of lame mind. Uh, I think we spent a little more than one year just to see how we can specialize generics without uh, breaking backward compatibility. And it's not that obvious. So the minimum value type, it was the first prototype. Basically, the idea is you have Java long object, which is uh, your uh, hierarchy of uh, object, what we call indirect object. And you have Java long values for all 
value types, and if you want to move from the an, in, uh, an inline object to a real or an old object, you will use boxing for doing this kind of thing. Um, Perf are really great with this model. There is no regression of performance in the existing code because there is no inline object in the existing code. But it doesn't work well with real application because for a lot of application, object is not the root of all indirect type, but it's the root of any types. Which means that uh, with the MVT prototype, we can't call println. We had to box the inline object to call println and things like this. So basically, it was great to see what performance we can get, but from the user point of view, it was not great. So the second prototype named LWorld, um, the idea is that object will be the root of any object, the classical inline object and the inline object. From the user point of view, it's far easier to use. And from the VM point of view, it's just madness. <laughs> because ma now it means that when you have an object, you have no idea if it's a pointer or not. And it means that um, you may have performance regression because of that. So basically the idea is the following. If you have a complex which is an inline class, you can see it as an object. So VM will do whatever. <laughs> there is no boxing, uh, in fact. And you can do as a uh, operation in the other way, which is you take an object and want to cast it as a complex. In that case, uh, you have two operations that are done. First, you have um, to see if the object is null, because if it's null, you can't put it is an in an inline object, so you have a null check and a check cast. So, <laughs> another uh, uh, way to have a null check, basically, or a null pointer exception. In terms of bytecode representation, it uh, starts to become a little scary. First, uh, in Java, there is something which is really, really great, is if you don't need to load a class, the VM will not load it. And it's, uh, it goes as far as, um, in this example, you have a class holder and you have another class. And in another class, you have a static method, get me a holder, that return a holder. In fact, if you execute this code, the class holder is not loaded at all. It's not because it's part, uh, even if, if it's part of the signature of the method, being part of the signature of the method doesn't load it. To load a class, you need to call a constructor, or a static method, or a static field on it. But for Valhalla, it's a big, big, big issue. Because it means that um, uh, to know if a class is an inline class or not, we have to inspect the content of the class. And for that, we need to load it. So currently, we have no idea if older is an inline class or not. And if it's an inline class, uh, instead of, uh, for the VM, instead of having a reference, we should have all the values instead. So this is uh, the, the first issue. So basically, inline class need to be loaded early. Uh, we need it to know the uh, layout in memories. Uh, this is mostly uh, uh, an, uh, hotspot things, but uh, in hotspots, the, um, the memory layout is uh, uh, created very early. Uh, we want, when you do a method call that take a complex, technically what you want to do uh, in, uh, in assembly is just send the two, uh, the two parts, the uh, uh, real part and the imaginary part. You don't have 
any kind of boxing and things like this. Which means that when you create a method, you have to know if it's an inline class or not. And the uh, last thing is uh, the verifier has to know if it's an inline class or not. You remember the verifier, the thing that doesn't trust the Java C code and will verify that you don't put an object inside an int or things like this. Uh, the verifier has to uh, check if you cannot put null inside an inline uh, class. So the solution is, uh, I don't know if you have taken a look to the bytecode, but inside the bytecode, uh, all classes are prefixed with L. And so we have uh, a new prefix for the inline class named Q. Uh, y L. Uh, by the way, nobody knows Y L. Oh, at, at least James Gosling doesn't know. I have <laughs> asked him. And uh, so Q it's for qualified. We need another qualifier, so it's Q. I know why it's Q. <laughs> <laughs> and the prototype is called L world because everything goes on L object, basically. And the name of the prototype. So. If I take a look to my inline class int box and I take a look to my method zero, which is static, inside the bytecode, I will have this signature. The descriptor will be something that takes no parameter and return a Q int box. Which means that if you put inline inside your class that already exists, you are breaking the binary compatibility. Yeah? Everybody has seen that? Uh, we have another problem, which is uh, inline class should be unmutable, but currently uh, in Java, if you are in the middle of the constructor, you can see that your immutable class is mutable. You see that the value is uh, is transitioning from null or zero to the right value. That's why you should not do anything in the constructor because it's hard to debug. So anyway, it means because we want uh, inline class to be really immutable from the VM's point of view, it means that we cannot use constructors. We have to find another way. Um, so the idea is, uh, when you write your constructor, the compiler will do a transformation and transform it to a static factory, a static method uh, in Java. And we introduce two new uh, instructions. One is named default value. What default value does is it's default value and an inline class, and it will initialize uh, an inline object with every field to zero, null, and, and so on, false. And we have with field that take one object and create a new one and initialize one of the field with the value. Which means that if you take a look to the constructor of inbox that say this value equals value, this is how the compiler transform it. So you can see this is a static method and it starts with default value. So I will have an int box with the value zero, and then I have a width field to initialize with the value pass as parameter. And by the way, you can see that it's, uh, the code is not that great. You have the swap in the middle instead of loading the thing in the right order. So again, this means that um, an inline class will not be backward compatible with an existing class. Because the way to initialize an inline class is not to call a constructor, but to call a static factory. So it's not because at the source level you just add inline, that at the bytecode level it's uh, binary compatible. Um, okay, so. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, this means that we will have to do some uh, kind of heroic effort if we want 
to be able to be bi binary compatible. Currently, our current plan is to not be binary compatible, at least for the preview release inside the GDK. It, will, it may change later. We, we may have some kind of dynamic bridge and things like this to be backward compatible, but it, not, it will not be the case, uh, at least for the preview. Uh, we have a new syntax uh, for uh, inline class we can call dot .default. It will use uh, uh, default value opcode, as I've just uh, shown. So initialize an object with all the value uh, uh, to zero. Um, there is a, uh, a kind of issue with inline class and concurrency which is an inline object is composed of several fields, which means that when I will load it or uh, store it, it will be multiple load or multiple store. And what if I have several threads that play with this kind of thing? And I will show you a demo of it. So just, just before, uh, just Mandel brought with the complex things. Uh, you can see that I'm using the, uh, the annotation in line, so my IDE is fine with it. If I run it in the IDE, I'll, um, um, because it's compiled by the IDE, it will not use uh, the annotation. So this is the time if I use complex as a classical class. And if I use it by running as a <laughs> the right version, you can just see how fast uh, these, are, these are the real values. The image has been generated. Yes, and the image. Uh, Th there's roughly generated. 16 million multiplication, double multiplication that are made. Yes, something. In computing uh, it's this, it's this a image. lot. But you, lot. you can see the difference, basically, between. Uh, so it's it's really great because it means that you can have a code code with real complex it's and not pay the cost of the abstraction basically <laughs> and I want to show another code which is the value tiering things uh, is everybody okay with so I have an inline class value with two longs, x and y. Uh, by the way, if I don't put final here, the compiler will put final for me because it's an inline class. And here, um, what I'm doing is I'm creating one. Uh, I don't know if you know this syntax in Java. You can do this kind of thing since Java 10. Is it um, an anonymous class? Yes, it's an anonymous class. I don't know the name, but var here knows the name. So when I use share here, it works. It's kind of great. We have the same syntax as JavaScript. <laughs> I don't know if it's as great. Re as not. readable. If yeah, it's, it's as readable, <laughs> but, but, but it's, it's, it's kind of great for a small example. Isn't it what is called non-denotable types? Yes, yes, it's it's a type you cannot write here. If I try to write it as object here, yes, it will not, it will not compile anymore. because there is no shared field in the object class. So basically, it's something like the name of the class dollar one or something like this, and I have no way to uh, to write it here. But mm -hmm. I can use var, and it's enough. So I have two threads here: one that write. Um, Zero, the other that one that write one, and if I run the code here, I see that there is no issue that x will be always equals to y. Oh, I will just stop it. Well, which is quite normal, right? <laughs> yes. We do not expect x to be different from y, don't we? <laughs> but if I run it here. Oh, oops. So what did happen? <laughs> <laughs> you, 
You mean that I'm just, I'm just, if I was in a pointer world, world, I would just be switching the pointer from the first value to the other. Yeah, so equals so here. I, so either, either both values are zero, solution. either both values are one, but I, um, I, I cannot observe a situation where I have both zero and one uh, in the two fields of my value object. Yeah, but if it's an inline object. Oh, I don't have pointers anymore. And in that case, you have two longs. And the VM has no way to write uh, 188 bytes in one write. So you, <laughs> you, you, you can be uh, descheduled in the middle of the write. And in that case, X and Y are not the same, the same value. Um, it's, it's not a bug. <laughs> It's a feature. It's a feature. And it's not a feature. We I mean. all know that, don't we? <laughs> but technically, it's not a bug because you have two threads and you're accessing the same memory with two threads without any uh, synchronize or things like this. So it's unprotected uh, synchronization. It should not work. Isn't it the same problem that we have on 32 bits processors where you move along from one place in memory? To another one, and you can observe yeah. the, the, the um, first part uh, of the long bin copied and not the other one. Currently, we have this problem on Android or uh, on a Raspberry Pi because usually there are 32 bits, and if you read and write a long, it will be read and write in two, in two different values. So, currently, if you see, you have two stores and two read and an unprotected concurrent access. And unprotected concurrent access are not guaranteed to work in Java. There is nothing in the uh, uh, spec that says it should work. The main issue is that there is a lot of code <laughs> somewhere on Maven and things that do these kind of things. Um, hopefully, um, I don't know if you know, but you have grid static analysis tools that will detect this kind of things. Uh, I think the one, I don't remember the one from Google that uh, it doesn't work if you, if you use um, the volatile keyword. But basically, if you don't use the vol volatile keyword, you would say this is an unprotected access. And it's a static analysis. So would, would the use of the volatile keyword on the on the, an instance of an inline object? Yeah, if you put the volatile keyword, it works. Okay. Because if you put the volatile keywords, you force the inline object has to be stored in the shared field okay. as as a but then you lose on the performance part. Yes. But but you have atomic access. You cannot both at the same time. <laughs> at least you have correct code. <laughs> and uh, and I, I cannot show you that volatile works because currently volatile doesn't work <laughs> with the current prototype. Another feature I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So uh, what we need to go to the uh, preview release uh, that we hope to, um, to have in, say, a little more than one, one year. Uh, first, we have to solve the or array covariance uh, regression. As I said, the main issue with having an object being the root of everything is mean that when you have a, an array of objects, it can be an array of pointers or it can be an array of values directly on inline object, directly. Like an array of structs, which means that the size of the array cell are not constant anymore, which means that the VM um, has to do some magic things, what we call loop duplication which is basically the VM has to see, oh, this is an access to the array, and I don't, uh, so the size of the cell can be different. So I will go up to the loop and duplicate the whole loop. So I will have great performance. So currently, um, it seems to work, yeah. <laughs> but it will be great if you test this kind of things. The other issue is how to deal with the method 
from objects, the public methods from object. Um, basically, what synchronized mean on an inline object? What wait and notify means? Does, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it means I mean, nothing at all because uh, synchronized mean uh, you want to have the same address, and if it's the same address, you, you can uh, uh, have a monitor corresponding to that address. But if there is no address, it's harder. So currently, it's just fail with an illegal illegal monitor state. Basically, it's the same idea. You cannot write synchronize free or any with any primitive types. Which makes sense. For system identity hash code, I don't know if you know this method. If you don't know, please don't take a look to the Java doc. <laughs> don't use it. Uh, so currently it's uh, retargeted to call hash code because um, there is no performance problem with this. Things. The main, main, main issue is what equals equals mean. <laughs> because now we are able to compare pointer with values. <laughs> and equals equals, uh, I mean, it's the equals equals of object. Because I can put my inline object inside an object and call equals equals. But it's the equals equals of object. It's not the equals equals of primitive types. Obviously, equals equals on an object compares a reference, and we have no reference. But it would make sense to say that C1, if C1 and C2 are two complex objects, saying that C1 equals equals C2, it would mean that those two complexes represent the same value. That would make sense. Uh, yeah, but you are breaking encapsulation if you are doing this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, uh, so basically we have three different semantics. One is to always return false, saying that are no pointer. We have no pointers here, just return false. Uh, the main issue with equals equals is that people think that equals equals is fast. First, this is currently false. I mean, it's false if you are using uh, real GC like, like ZGC or Chenendoa. Your equals equals is not fast. I don't know if you know. Oh, now you know. So this is the first issue. People think that equals equals is fast, but it's it may be not. And um, the, the second issue is if if you start to do uh, equals equals that compare the content of the different field. It means that equals equals has to sniff what is the inline class, which means that if you have the same equals equals, which is called with several inline things, you will have a switch on type <laughs> in the middle equal. of equals equals. Oh, perf <laughs> will be not great. And it's worse than that because if you inline, now, uh, if you do equals equals on every fields, if a field is an object, it can also contain an inline object. So you have a recursive equals equals. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just madness. It's madness, but it's currently what the prototype does. Um, just to evaluate the cost of doing an equals equals, which is... Uh, um, so, yeah. Um, uh, we don't know... Uh, what semantics uh, to use. Um, basically, it seems that there are two different ways to uh, have an inline uh, class. Either you want an inline class like optional, and in, in that case, you don't want to do an equals equals on it. You don't want to have equals equals that work on optional. Or you have something like a complex. In that case, you want equals equals to work. Or integer. Or yes, or anything that represents uh, more value, and not something like um, like a monad. <sighs> Obviously, you never use equals equals. You always use dot equals, and the problem is solved. Yes. Nobody use equals equals because it will be faster. Yes. No idea does that when it generates the no, equals no, method no, of no, an object. No, 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 no. 
just think that equals equals is it's not fast because you're adding a new branch in your code and branch can be slow. Um, basically, if you, you you write equals equals inside the dot equals method, so equals equals will be called sometimes and not sometimes. So the CPU will not be able to predict it correctly. So basically, you are making your code slower. And we have the problem of erased generics, which is when you have a T somewhere, you can always store null inside a T. It currently works, but obviously it will not work with um, an inline class. So basically, if I have a map of string complex and I call map.get, um, by contract, map.get should return null, but because the map should return a complex, a complex cannot be null. So if uh, you run, you, you use this code with the current uh, prototype, it doesn't compile, but if with the magic pass, you can generate the code. And in that case, you will have a, a, a null pointer exception in a code that you don't write. You will have a null pointer exception because um, when you have erased generics, the compiler insert cast when you uh, come from object to the real. And those cast will not work. So it's, it's a major issue if the compiler had a cast that cause a null pointer exception. Um, so currently, uh, we have a way um, um, uh, an interface can be an inline class or an indirect class, uh, the usual class. Uh, so what we are uh, we are thinking currently is uh, to have a way to automatically derive an interface from an inline class. The idea is where you write your own inline class and the compiler will generate this code, which create an interface named box, sealed, it permit only one class. We are reusing the thing of under here. And so basically, if you want a new label complex, you can use complex.box. Because complex.box, it's an interface, it will allow null, and the only other possible implementation is a complex inline object. So for the VM, it's a signal that it can optimize the whole things. Which means that um, um, you will not be able to write a map string complex, but you will be able to write a map string complex dot box. Basically, it's exactly the same problem that when you have a map that take int as parameter, it doesn't compile. You have to put integer instead. But the great thing is that if you use an interface, it's not a real boxing. It's a kind of lightweight boxing that the VM knows and will try to remove, if it's possible. Um, we still don't know how to uh, work with integers, because people are writing equals equals on integer. I know that you don't do it, but some people are writing equals equals. So basically here we have two solutions. The first one that we call the purge, which is at, uh, at one day we will decide to kill all the people that are writing equals equals <laughs> on integer. The other solution is to do what Graal does, which is if you use new integer, it will be the old integer. And if you use integer dot value of you have a bit that say, oh, it's a kind of inline value. Please optimize it. Uh, currently, it seems that Graal works, so we may do something like this. And um, for optional, obviously, we want optional to be an inline class. But as I said, it's not binary compatible. So here we will introduce, uh, because uh, optional 
is a class of the GDK, we can introduce a special hack inside the VM. See? If you see L optional, in fact, it's a Q optional. Obviously, it will work great for optional, but not for your code. <laughs> so just uh, to finish, um, so we are currently at the time where you can test your code. Uh, even if you don't use inline class, just test and report regression. Because you, there might be regression, because now object is a root of every type. We hope to have a release soon that may be introduced in the GDK. Uh, we are talking about introducing in the GDK, but will be only to be used inside the GDK. So at least we can use it for HMAP and things like this. Currently, currently, if you want to use Valhalla, you need to download the preview version that yes. is distributed yes. on the OpenJDK uh, site. So you don't need yeah. to, to build your branch yourself. Yeah, you, you can build it. Well, you can you do want. it also. You can download it from your GitHub repo. But, uh, and so uh, what you will <coughs> got uh, with the preview is... So an inline class has no identity, it's not mutable, it's not nullable, and it's tearable. <laughs> but if you accept all of these awful things, what you have is um, basically you don't pay the cost of an inline object on the stack, and you have your object in line, in line uh, inside the other, uh, on the heap. Please, 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 don't use equal equals. And uh, we will have support of uh, generics use, using the lightweight. I know there is a question that everybody is asking themselves. Is it, it, does it support serialization? Oh, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> uh, currently, no. But, um, currently, no and yes. Well, optionals I, are not serializable I mean, anyway. So. What I'm saying is, uh, if you write your own, uh, there is no magic for the serialization. It works with the classical serialization. Mm -hmm. But once record will be uh, merged with uh, Valhalla, you, you will be able to re uh, declare a rec an inline record. And, and you'll have serialization. And you will have serialization for free. You see, I got another question about the string class. Are there any plans? Because uh, uh, no. in, inlining <laughs> integers or an optional, that, that seems quite easy. But the string class, the, the, the array can be as big as, yes. as, you, as so, you want. So, so, so uh, basically, currently, if you have an array, an array is still a reference. There is no array which is an inline class. Okay. We have a project called array uh, 2.0, which, which will be able to have this kind of array. And at that point, we may be able to have string. And in the meantime, would it make sense to have a specialized string with a only yeah, yeah, um, small arrays in it? Like, yeah, yeah. I don't know, string or like four some, or five characters? Some of us have played with that idea. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you took a look to, to my GitHub. Uh, we did, I know we did. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have a class like this, but... Um, um, Currently, it means you have two representation of the same. You have the small compact string and the big string. And uh, s uh, switching between the two is a cost that you pay every time. So it's in terms of performance, it's not that great. For instance, if you need to make keys for hash maps that are small strings, like... Yeah, you, uh, yeah, you, you, can, you, you can use it, but I, I think it's better to just have a, a record in line in that case. And okay. Great. It will just work. So indeed, that's it. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for questions. Yeah. Don't we? There's a slide for the questions. We have a slide for the questions. Yeah, oh, we have a slide for the questions. Yes, we have one here, please. Um, do we have a mic? Try to shout. <laughs> Too funny. So the question is why 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 don't you just <laughs> 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 uh, 
All right. Uh, using an annotation instead of this weird syntax for the constructor. Um, so to, uh, to, is to make uh, please, uh, sorry at the end of the question to make some validation while constructing re yes. records. Um, so if you take a look um, uh, in in the spec of Java, there is no annotation that will change the behavior of your code. You have annotation that will that the compiler will use or things like this. But you have no annotation that will change the behavior. And it's written explicitly in the spec that annotation should never change the behavior of the code. So we are playing with the book that was written in uh, 2004, I think, when annotation were introduced. Yes, Java 5. And, and currently, we can hack Java C to do whatever you want, we want. So th the main issue is we don't have a grid syntax for it. Any other questions? Well, I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Ari. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>